Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with jazz composer and pianist Sarah McKenzie. When the coronavirus hit in early March, she was just on tour in France and all of her shows got canceled. At the same time, the U.S. government implemented a travel ban for everyone who was traveling from the territory she was in, and she was unable to return home to Los Angeles immediately. In order not to get stuck during lockdown in a big city, she rented an old schoolhouse in the very south of England, and it was time to get busy. They planned to stay two weeks, and in the end, it was three and a half months. Music and so much more happened, she explains. Enjoy. Wonderful. Hey, thank you for taking a minute for Neon Jazz today. Hey, no, thanks for asking me. That's great. You have a very unique story here. You know, I mean, I think I think that's the thing about this whole COVID world that we're living in right now. You know, I did a lot of interviews mm. when this all began, and I've consistently done interviews. And, you know, it's almost kind of like the only other measuring stick in our modern history is to kind of go back to 9-11. Like, where were you when the second plane went in? There's almost this moment around March where it's like, mm. what happened and I know personally, I was in uh, uh, I was in the back of a water taxi in Venice during 9/11, and I my flight from Paris did not exist anymore to come back home. So when I read your bio of what's going on and how it all, I had to go under the English Channel just to get to Gatwick because Heathrow wouldn't fly me out. So there's all of these things that are flashbacky about what you're doing that I kind of went through during a very tumultuous time to try to get back to America. So. My question to you is, let's start the alpha here. Kind of talk to me a little bit about when you started seeing the tsunami happen with this whole quarantine lockdown. Yeah, I mean, I had tried to make um, a concert tour in France, and um, we just arrived, and the concert that we were supposed to do in Nice got cancelled on that day. And actually, I was having uh, dinner that evening, and the French told us in the restaurant that... uh, you know, they're going to shut down the whole country tomorrow, you know. <laughs> so you won't be able to have any more food in restaurants, wow. you know. So, okay, we got out to England, um, which was still open at the time, but I think it was only a few days later that they were announcing a lockdown. And, of course, one by one, all of the concerts planned for the tour uh, were cancelled. At that point, I guess... You know, if you're in a, a big city like London um, and also you don't have a home there, um, it's not a good idea, I think, you know, to be locked up in a one hotel room. So the idea was to go somewhere where there was a lot of nature, and I think it was a great decision. So I headed down to the south of England, uh, just near Hastings, uh, and it's uh, actually the country park around there is so beautiful, and also the White Cliffs of Dover are only you know, 40 minutes away. So it was an absolutely beautiful place. And um, the only reason I was there, actually, is because <laughs> I found a place in the countryside with a piano. Um, but the place was actually beautiful, um, a very old uh, English-style, second um, history-listed, sort of almost like a castle, um, modest, but uh, really very, very, very beautiful. But, yes, the draw card was the piano, and also they had a... Uh, a recording studio just around the corner with a baby grand piano um, and a really nice guy there. So it was actually perfect conditions to start working 24-7. So, you know, I was very lucky because we were locked down, but in our hour of exercise, you know, could get out and walk, you know, the coast and, you know, think about everything a little bit more meaningfully, I suppose, and slow down a little bit, reflect and then come to the piano and just really create for the sake of creating and then go into the recording studio and record what I'd been working on during the day. So initially it was a very stressful moment, (laughs) but in hindsight, uh, three and a half later, it was a real blessing uh, to have that place and to, to have all the conditions that I had because it was an incredibly productive time for me. You know, what's strange about what's going on right now is I'm witnessing a a, a very unfortunate deja vu. Um, I know the schools in our area are now closing down again. My my kids actually got to go back to school for a little bit, and we're getting ready to go into winter, and everything's closing down. All I hear and smell is March again. So it's it's a weird kind of thing that's happening because I think we all thought this was going to get better. Where are you now after all of this? Uh, Los Angeles, I mean, after after three and a half months, uh, we did discover that we could get back to the States 
via Croatia, which isn't on the list of banned countries. So, but you have to quarantine there for 14 days. So we've actually done that twice because, as you say, with your kids, you know, they got to go back to school for a little bit. We had a tour which was cancelled, you know, from the first time. They rebooked it, so we tr we tried to make it, and we did make four out of the five concerts. Oh, wow. But coming, but coming back again, we, we did the 14-day uh, <laughs> quarantine. But, you know, I'm, I'm glad that we made, you know, every effort that we possibly could at this time. I think the tendency is to probably give up, you know, and be, you know, very miserable because it's, I mean, it's terrible, you know, particularly for the arts. So many people have just lost their job, you know, lost their whole industry. So I feel very, um, I don't know, proud in some ways that through this time we've been able to keep working and keep creating some great things and also, you know, really try to make every concert that's there and, because also the people, you know, have been locked down for months as well. And particularly in France, they were so enthusiastic to have a concert again, you know. So it's, um, yeah, I, I feel very lucky uh, to have had the opportunities that I've had during this time. That's for sure. We're not out of it yet, so. No, no, we're not. I, I thought we were getting somewhere, but yeah. I. So was it just unbelievably relieving to be back on stage? Yes, absolutely. And more than that, you know, you think, oh, maybe no one's going to come out. I guess that's the fear. No one wants to see live music anymore. But everyone came out. And, uh, you know, the concerts were sold out. So it was very encouraging um, to to see that, I suppose. So talking about your song, Inspired by the Autobahn, talk to me a little bit about <laughs> that's really the single that we're kind of honing in on. And I guess there may be some metaphors with being on a highway with no speed limit, the danger we're living through right now. So um, kind of talk to me a little bit about this. Yeah, no, well, I composed this song, Schneller, and um, I, d I don't know what I was thinking, really. But, you know, I love Dizzy Gillespie, and um, I love that Latin sort of sound uh, with the swing of jazz. I really love, you know, blues and swing, you know. That, for me, that's... That's jazz, that's everything. And I wanted to create a song based on my experience on the German highway. Uh, I was on it recently and uh, it was terrifying uh, going so fast. And after I picked my hands out of the dashboard, I knew that this experience definitely needs a song. Um, so this is how the song came about. And uh, in Hastings, I thought, you know what, I need to... This song is, you know, the Audubon, you, you can go, there are no speed limits, so you can go as fast as you want, and this is, this is a loud, fast song, so how can I make it more dramatic than it already is? And I thought, well, how about we get the trumpet, you know, involved, and maybe not have one trumpet, but four trumpets, you know, that'll, <laughs> that should do it. Um, yeah. So I wrote a sort of mini big band thing, and then went about trying to find the right person to play it, and uh, couldn't go past jazz at Lincoln Center's Kenny Rampton, who is an extraordinary trumpet player and who did just a marvelous job on the song uh, alongside Donald Edwards on the drums. I can't mm. believe the, the... I asked for a poinciana groove, you know, something sort of between Latin and um, Bud Powell, and uh, he came up with something extraordinary with uh, an incredible groove on the cowbell. It's so unique, uh, and the whole thing worked so well given that we all recorded from our respective countries and it was put together post you know it's quite amazing really yeah. and particularly for jazz because you would think that actually it wouldn't work because of the nature of the music um, but we were very sort of careful with how we put it together I find that if you record the bass first and then if the piano records on top of that and really locks in with the, the bassist and listens to the bass lines, you know, just like you would do on, on a live uh, concert. Uh, then we had the trumpet. Kenny put his part in. And then Donald on the drums reacts to everything. And if you do that, you know, everyone's played their own improvised solos. Uh, um, and Donald has reacted to everything uh, that he's heard. So it is a very reactive recording actually it's just that it wasn't done in the same room so I, I find it quite quite amazing and I, I had a great time actually recording these 10 songs for they were part of a larger project called music connects our world and um, this was one of the songs 
and you know it was really amazing actually to to create these songs while being in your own house or country <laughs> and still work with musicians from you know Brazil to Argentina to America to Hungary you know it's really incredible so when we do return to the stage when things get back to you know full force what do you hope both musician and the audience realizes about this time away from live music I hope they realize you know that there's always um it seems like culture and music are always the first things to go, you know. It's always the thing that is hardest hit, and everyone says, well, it's not an essential service. And that's true. It's, it's not essential, I suppose. You know, it's not, you know, you need food and you need shelter and you need some money to keep you going and you need medicine, I suppose. But music is not essential, but it, it is in a way. You know, it is, because I think what everyone has found being locked up in their homes, the whole whole time is that it's incredibly soul destroying you know to be just locked up to not see anyone to not go out to not uh you know there's there's that part of it um i don't know i just uh, of course i'm in the arts but i think music does a wonderful service for everybody for you know to inspire um to connect people you know it's what a wonderful thing music is you know as i was saying i've been playing this time with musicians in Brazil and Argentina. And, um, you know, music is a way to connect people. It's got a very peaceful message. Um, and I think that's important at this time too, you know. I find that people who play music have a greater sense of empathy and um, humility and uh, intelligence and understanding. They're curious people. They are deep-thinking people. And these are the kind of people you want in a society, you know. You don't yeah. want to have a society where no one appreciates the arts or, or music because then you just have people who are what? They're just self-interested people. Just, okay, you have your business, you're, it's all about you, you do your PR, you know. And, but the, you're creating monsters, you know. The, the beautiful thing about music is the sense of, you know, humility it gives everyone. You know, you've, you've got to listen to each other in order to play in a band. So... I just think it's so important and um, it's un underrated. So I, I hope that, you know, everyone sort of comes back and sees that it, we really need, you know, music and the arts and it is it is important. Um, and so I, I hope that there's some sort of renewed sense of importance placed back on it. Uh, I think, I definitely think we need it in order to, to become a thriving, you know, community. I agree. I agree. Sarah, thank you for taking a minute out to talk about your journey in this very strange, surreal world. Good luck with the, the single and with everything as we move forward. I appreciate it. Hey, thank you for having me. That's wonderful. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview where we give you a bit of insight into the finest singers and players in England, France, America, and spots all over the world giving fans all that jazz. Thanks to Sarah for her time and story. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino in the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com. And for everything Neon Jazz all the time, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.